Well, thank you, organizers, uh, especially with Google. I think Carlos is the other organizer here, but I think they didn't really organize it. Um, very well organized conference. I just said, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. It's probably an obvious thing. Very well organized conference, and I really enjoyed my first visit to Moscow. So today, um, what I'm going to talk about uh, may seem a little disconnected from Higgs bundles, but actually it's motivated by work on Higgs bundles that we did um, about 10 years ago. On um, uh, understanding the topology of the modularized space of Higgs bundles by doing more theory on the infinite dimensional singular space of Higgs bundles. So that was the motivation, and at the end of the talk, I'll um, give some questions in this direction as well. Uh, but for now, I want to talk about uh, finite dimensional Morse theory on the space of equivalent representations. So I'll just um, review some basic Morse theory to motivate uh, some of the constructions. So the basic idea of Morse theory is to write uh, critical points in some smooth function on a manifold to the topology of that manifold. So we need, I've been very loose with the definition so far, I'll um, sort of explain those in more detail in a minute, um, but we need some conditions on a manifold and function for this to work. So if we have a compact Ramonian manifold with some smooth function, then the condition one condition that you need is um, for the function of course. Essentially, that means that you have good local properties around each critical point. Each critical point looks like a saddle point or a high dimensional saddle point. So, once you have that, then the main theorem of Morse theory says that these manifolds, MA and MB, for different values of A and B, are related by attaching a cell. So, I'll just draw a picture of this. this uh, famous Morse theory picture of the chorus. So the smooth function in this case is the height function. And if you start with say A down here, that corresponds to this subset. If B is up here above the, the critical point here, then the two manifolds are related about the homotopy by attaching the cell here. This is the E way of this picture. Okay, so the key idea is that the homotopy type changes the local class of the critical point. For example, um, you can use this to prove that critical points exist. Um, if you know the homotopy type is different, then you know a critical point exists. This is useful, for example, in proving uh, solutions of PDEs exist. Um, conversely, if you know something about how the cell E lambda is attached to MA, you can try and relate the topology of MA to the topology of MB. So this is the philosophy that we're going to use. Okay, so to prove um, most, uh, this main theorem of Morse theory, you need the Morse lemma. Um, so I won't go through all the details of that, but I'll just say that the proof of the main theorem uses the fact that n is a manifold, um, but it's either compact or the function is proper, or maybe some more general condition like condition C or something And also you need good local behavior of n the critical point. So for example, if it's a nice saddle point, like in this picture, or maybe some weaker condition. Spot or minimally general, more general ways of the same. So what I want to study is certain functions on singular spaces. So for example, um, the space of all Higgs bundles uh, is one of these examples, this is an infinite dimensional. Um, in finite dimensions, we like to study these on algebraic varieties. And essentially, none of the properties hold because the variety may not be a manifold, um, it may not be compact, or the function may not be proper, and it may not even satisfy condition C. And around the critical points, the uh, local behavior of that, you can't really measure it by studying, taking the derivatives and studying the measure. Okay. But we'd still like to prove an analog of the main theorem of Morse theory in this setting. So, two more things uh, motivated from just the basic theory. So, one is the um, the, when you try to compute cohomology using uh, Morse theory, it immediately has Morse inequality. It's just by comparing the cohomology of M A to the cohomology of M B and noting that the attachment is a cell E lambda, you can relate the cohomology to some long tax sequences. So these two polynomials, the Poincare A polynomial, which tells you about the uh, cohomology of the space, and the Morse polynomial, which tells you about the cohomology of the critical sets, or the number of critical sets, uh, with each 
unique index, those two are related by those more semicolons. So the condition that you would want if you want to compute some cohomology is that the most function is perfect. So you want this right hand side to vanish. In general, it may not. And for example, that can be useful if you want to prove that critical points are used for some function. Okay, so let's uh, restrict to the perfect case for a moment. So if it is perfect, then if you look at this long exact sequence here, providing the cohomology of MV and MA, then this boundary map is zero. Okay. So you would like to prove that this map is zero. And there's a principle called the Morse completion principle, which gives a sufficient condition for this to be zero. It says that um, if the thing that you're attaching the lambda is the boundary of some one-dimensional cell, so for example, here's a one-dimensional cell. So the boundaries are the same, so that means that when you write down this exact sequence, you get zero of the boundary. So the question is, um, so the next question is, if you have some function on a singular space, and you're not just attaching cells, but something more complicated, uh, what happens to this completion principle? And can we prove some criterion for perfection of functions on similar spaces? <coughs> so one more thing that will be related to the rest of the talk is this idea of the Morse complex on a manifold at the moment. So if you have additional properties, so for example the stable and unstable sets of the critical points intersect transversely, then you can write down a Morse complex um, to compute the cohomology. And you can try and understand the cohomology in terms of taking the cohomology of that complex, um, which is somehow computable in terms of the spaces of the one So the basic idea is for any pair of critical sets, so for example, in this picture here, you've got this critical point. In this critical point, you want to understand all the points that flow up to this critical point and down to this critical point. Or more generally, these could be just critical sets for some function. So um, the way you construct a cut product is you have the space of uh, points that flow up to one critical point down to the other. There are natural projection maps given by taking the limit of the flow in each direction. And the cut product is given in this way. So if you take something in the cohomology of the lower critical set and something in the cohomology of the relative cohomology of the um, um, sorry, this should be the space of flow lines connecting, so this should be an F. Then the cut product is just given by those push points. So you take the cohomology class F and put it back up here, cut it with the cohomology class E1, and then push it back down to the upper critical set. So somehow you're taking cohomology here and using the space of flow lines to map it to some cohomology support up here in the Morse complex. Something that's not emphasized in the literature on this, but I want to emphasize in this talk, is that these maps factor through the space of pairs of critical points connected by flow lines. So in this picture, it's not so exciting, there's only one pair because the critical points are distinct. But if you have, say, critical manifolds, you can look at how the um, manifolds are related by flow lines. So you want to look at all the pairs such that one point is an upper critical point, one point is a lower critical point. So it's an actual forgetful map from F down to P, and the point is that this cut product map is factored through the space P. For example, if omega, um, the form of coupling we got here, is the top class of this, and this is the last bundle, then all you're doing is just pulling back, wedging with the top class and pushing forward, then you're just doing a pullback and push forward. Or actually goes that way from the lower critical point to the upper critical point. Pull it back. So that's one example of an omega that might be useful for the Tom class of some other one. Okay, so here's um, one class of functions on singular spaces that I want to study. So for example, if you have, um, we've seen this in a few places um, during the talks this week. So if you have some complex reductive group acting on um, some affine <coughs> space, then the maximal compact subgroup, uh, the action is Hamiltonian, and you can write down a moment map for that action. So 
So I write that down, but you have some function back into the, uh, the dual of the layout or the uh, compact subgroup. And you can consider a subvariety, maybe smooth, maybe not, um, which is um, preserved by the group action. And you can think of a central element in the dual of the Lie algebra. You can take the symplectic quotient of that subvariety. So that's a smooth variety that's well developed theory that you can to use more theory in the space. So this turns out to satisfy a generalized version of the main theorem of Morse theory that I explained before. And the more set qualities become qualities in the set. So the question is, what if you don't have a smooth variety? What if it's going to be some serial space? So I'll give some examples. There are many interesting modular spaces, such as the modular space of Higgs bundles. It's an um, infinite dimensional quotient of an infinite dimensional single space. And quibbles with relations are another example of the quotient quotients of single variety. So what we'd like to do is somehow generalize this method of using Morse theory and apply it to uh, study the topology of symplectic quotients and more generally study the Morse complex on those spaces. So these are the two main examples, so representations of quivers and a couple of equations in gauge theory, maybe um, Higgs bundles, but also maybe say Bramble Hills or other couple of equations as well. So if we want to do this, we need some um, some theorems that are not, have not been proven yet. So one of those is the main theorem of Morse theory in the setting. And another one is how to describe all the points that flow up to a particular critical point. So here, as in the smooth case, you always get some nice unstable manifolds firing around the critical points. But in the singular setting, anything could happen. If you take this manifold and you set it in some singular space, you don't know how to describe it. The unstable sense. So we need to do that somehow. And then once you've done that, we'd like to develop some sort of version of the Morse inequalities and some criteria for when the Morse inequalities become qualities. And the main idea, which is, um, which is new in this setting, is that the cut product structure on the Morse complex is related to Nakajima's work in geometric representation theory. So we go back and I'll state this theorem later on. This space P uh, is related to Nakajima's Hecker correspondence. So there's push pull maps back and through the Hecker correspondence. <coughs> okay, so I'll just describe the main theorem of Morse theory uh, for singular spaces. So um, the previous theorem that I described uses all these conditions. So it has to be a manifold, so you have good local coordinates around the critical points, some kind of compactness condition. And some sort of nice local behavior in a way. The fact that it's a uh, hyperbolic uh, dynamical system on the south or something like that. So we want to replace these conditions, each of these conditions somehow. Okay, so if you take some real minority manifold and then you take some closed subset which is preserved by the gradient flow. So on the manifold, you have some nice gradient flow, um, assuming you have a nice function. And um, you can write down the gradient flow equations and suppose that the solution exists globally forwards and backwards in time. Yeah. So um, we're not saying it exists globally, even in nice cases, we make a lot of finite times we're up to infinity, um, but at least forwards at last in time. Most importantly, it preserves a singular space. So um, you start with a singular space, you're in the singular space, you end with a singular space, so you start with a singular space, you're in the singular space, you're all tired, so the flow is so then you can define a critical point on the singular space to be just a fixed point of this flow. So uh, even though it's not a manifold, we're saying essentially that the critical point is the critical points on the ambient manifold intersected with the singular space. So if there's a space that's observed by the flow, then that definition makes sense. Okay, so firstly what we want are that the critical values of the function are isolated. So that's a reasonable condition. So I guess these conditions um, seem quite technical, but I want to say that um, they're all reasonable conditions. They're not something that um, they're not some crazy function that never appears in practice. So isolated critical values, that's definitely something reasonable. The second one is the compactness condition. So 
in this case, if the Ethernet, suppose you have um, from Sora to the south point. So here's your critical point, or it could be some critical set. If you start in some neighborhood here and start flying down, either you escape down the bottom or you fall into the critical point. And the same in reverse type as well. Either you escape up the top or maybe you flow up to the critical point. So there's not a spiral around a critical set like that, and you can't just fall off the side and then. So that's the replacement for the compactness condition. And that's also quite reasonable. For example, um, in Blaze's paper on Morse theory, the proof that if condition C is satisfied, then this condition is satisfied as well. Okay, so that's the main thing, that either the flow escapes the set or it converges to a proof. And that's true for any finite A and B. Okay, so now we want some um, condition on the local behavior, some replacement for the Morse code. So this one is that if you, I'll just draw the saddle point in here. So of course I've drawn a manifold, but it could be any space. So if you take the level set of the function, so the function maybe looks something like this, here's the critical level, and here's just below the critical level. Then if you intersect that with the unstable set, and these points here, and another point over the back here, sort of trying to draw this three-dimensional, <coughs> then inside the space, if you take any neighborhood of this intersection, like that, then there exists some small open set around the critical point, such that every point could either flow into the critical point, you can never avoid that, or maybe, uh, or if it doesn't flow into the critical point, it has to flow into the set somehow. So if you get another point here, maybe it flows down there. So the thing that can't happen is it can't sort of flow off to the side and never go into the set. Okay, so you can do that for arbitrarily small sets down here. That's the condition. So once again, that's a reasonable condition. For example, if you have a Morse function, so I just drew that example, we have a nice saddle point that, of course, it's going to work. Um, more generally, it may not um, have a nice saddle point structure, but you can still impose this condition on the flow. So for reasonable functions, this happens. The only ones where it, don't, where it doesn't happen, I'd say, for example, on an infinite dimensional space, the negative eigenvalues could go down to zero, and so the flow becomes progressively more horizontal as you go to near the critical point. Or maybe some other pathological examples too. Like, for example, you can just tuck this space open along here and separate it out, and of course, this won't work because if you flow down this side, you can never get into the same. But of course, you would never do um, most of it in such a sort of part open space. So, for a nice space like a variety of them, Okay, so this is all about the flow so far. Um, one more condition in this, um, some condition on the serial space. So for example, if you try to Morse theory on, say, a wide area or something crazy like that, then it's not going to work, so you need to exclude anything like that. So this last assumption is this local contractibility condition, which just says that there's some neighborhood of this intersection here and a nice more neighborhood like that, such that you can retract it monotonically onto that set. Maybe I could draw another picture of this. So if you do have some single space, and that point of intersection up there, maybe it looks like some single space like that, you want to develop some two or neighborhood and such that you can retract it onto the single space. Okay, so I'll explain how to do that um, soon, but the point is for, say, for example, an analytic variety, these two to one neighborhoods do exist, so they're, they're nice. So for reasonable space, then, um, sorry, I went backwards instead of forwards. No one said that. <laughs> so, so this is the condition, sorry, the local contractibility. So for reasonable space, this sort of thing happens. So, this tubular neighborhood is the um, interval from 0 to 1 here. Okay, 
So that's the idea. You want to somehow retract on the recruitment set. And if everything's nice and analytic, then you can do that. Okay, so the first result um, says that if you have all these conditions, then the main theorem of Morse theory holds. So even though the conditions seem quite technical, then um, as we saw, you know, they're not unreasonable. You know, reasonable function of unreasonable spaces to satisfy these conditions. So if you have assumptions one and four, then essentially an analog of the main theorem of Morse theory holds. So we take um, the space of the improvement set. And that's not a topic to the space for all the previous set, meaning the unstable set. Which is now no longer a cell, but some sort of uh, similar space that you're attaching. Moreover, and this is useful if you want to do everything k equal variantly with respect to some group action, if you have some group acting on space and the function is k variant, and the previous deformation of track is also k invariant, then everything is k equivariant. So the strength of the equivalence here is equivariant. So in particular, it's an isomorphism of the equivariant problem. Okay, so this is the main technical theorem. So of course it's good, but what if nothing satisfied the conditions? So it's, of course it's completely useless. So um, the next theorem says that the theory is not empty, so there is actually a class of examples. So these examples contain interesting examples. So more importantly, this class of examples includes spaces of representations of equivalence configurations. So more generally, it just monomaps maps on analytic varieties. Okay, so this is uh, the next theorem. So that says the main theorem of Morse theory works in the setting. And the separate theorem due to uh, Marcus Pfeil and myself, so we proved that um, you can do this equivariant. So, um, so for example, analytic varieties have nice triangulations and more generally nice wiki stratifications. But if you want this assumption for deformation of tracks that I described here, you know, then you need some equivariant. So you need to show that this is equivariant with respect to some group action. So that's what we did. So um, we showed that when you construct this neighborhood, you can actually do that in terms of a control data for the wiki stratification, such that this deformation of track here is equivalent. So for example, maybe I just draw another picture. This is a singular set. You can resolve that singularity. Maybe you can make it look like this, such that each of these flat sets map onto part of the singular space, like this. And then this has a nice two-door neighborhood, which you can make equivariant. So we we'll control data defining the deformation retraction as equivariant. And then you can do the deformation retract up here, and that projects down to here. So, so you, um, are you assuming that the critical points are um, isolated, or? Um, just the critical values. Just the critical values. Yeah, critical points could be critical mm -hmm. sets. Mm -hmm. um, and generally, you get some good value in the ground. Yeah, so that means um, in this theorem 2 here, you can make everything equivariant. OK, so here's an example. So we saw this before um, in Ben's talk, before lunch. So um, I won't go through uh, representation of the quickness, but I'll use this example of the ADHA group. So what we're doing is um, we start with this equivalent here, which is just a directed graph. We attach um, complex emission of X spaces in each vertex. And we want to solve some relations or some equations defined by homomorphisms going on the paths in the graph here. So we have two equations. So one is these relations here. So we want this commutativity condition, or sort of deformed commutativity condition on A and B, um, essentially this quadratic polynomial in the, in the uh, homomorphism is zero. And then also this modern map equation, which uses the commission structure on the vector spaces. And then you have this group action. So you have a um, group back in here. So really this is just a quibble with one vertex, and you attach this extra shadow vertex, just like in Venice talk before lunch. And 
and um, we have a group backend on the original vertex, and that acts in its way on the on the whole vertex. So this is the induced group action on its um, spaces of homomorphism between vector spaces. <coughs> so the reason, the original motivation for this, this is even before the existence of quivers, was um, the ADHM construction. So solutions to these equations multiply the iterative. Um, these parameterized this of on S4. And more generally, um, this is a later result to Kronheim and Academia that says that you can construct instantons on certain four manifolds for part of A or E spaces using by generalizing this construction. So replacing a single vertex with some um, affine AD Lincoln diagram. Again, all the arrows between the vertices are doubled, just like in the last plot. So between each vertex, on each edge of the graph, you have one arrow in one direction and another arrow in another direction. Each vector space has another vector space attached to it. So the group acts on the Vs, and it's an induced group action on the homomorphisms. And when you um, put that together with some relations, which I haven't written down here, um, but essentially they're a generalization of the relations of Previous slide, then you parameterize instantons over these hypercode form manifolds, which you can also construct as quiver parameters. So there are other types of quivers as well that are interesting, um, where the edges aren't necessarily double. double. So, for example, um, Hansel quivers, which were um, Nakajima used to study representations of W articles. So these are this form. So I won't go through the whole construction, but um, I'll just say that the relations, which correspond to this polynomial here, um, as you can see again, this is a quadratic polynomial. So these quadratic polynomials appear in all of the interesting examples, or many interesting examples. And they also satisfy another condition, which I'll describe now. So this is something called completeness of the relations. So, um, essentially, we need this for the construction later in um, the talk today. And this is some uh, condition that's satisfied by all of the Nakajima's examples. So, what this says is, um, maybe I can draw this over here, apologies to the people on the other side. So, um, let's draw that ADH. <coughs> So um, each relation, in this case, so A B minus B A minus J I equals zero. And this is the one relation in this quiver. So for each vertex um, or each edge going to the head of the relation, so that all the relation always takes something here and maps it back to this vector space again. Um, for each edge going into this row, into this vertex, that must appear in the first term in this relation. So you can see here A, B, and J all appear in the front of this relation here. And the second condition is that the um, for each edge such as the tail is the tail of the vertex, so the initial um, vertex in the relation then that must also satisfy a similar condition. In this case, the relation must be unique. So you can see I here has a tail as this vertex, so that appears as the second term in the relation. And the same with A and B as well. So this condition is satisfied um, in all of Nakajima's examples, and also in some other examples as well. So for example, this one now. Sorry, I think too far from the computer. Yes. Yeah, okay, so for example, you can just slightly generalize the ADHM construction example just by adding an arbitrary number of groups into the vector space B. Um, and then if you fit any permutation on N letters, then you can define a new relation which looks like this. These don't have to be plus one, it can be any non zero one. Then you can check that this example also has complete relations too. So that's 
So complete relations is um, contains, but it's not limited to all of that. Okay, so um, we want to do Morse theory to study representations of quivers. So the basic picture is that you have this space of representations, this singular space. So I'm just going to draw it somewhat like a forest picture. So you have a moment map and you have some stability parameter here. Then this defines a height function on this affine variety. And you have these critical sets here. So you have a minimum, this is the most important one, and you also have a non-minimum critical sets. So just by writing down the equations, for anyone um, who's familiar with the work of the team and block for Yangon's theory, you probably remember that the um, whole morphic structure splits into uh, sub-bottoms at a critical point. It's really the same for critics as well. And if you use this stability parameter um, for NAC Dini's, so I won't go into the details, but the idea is that um, at critical points you only get two terms in the split. You get one, which is a stable representation of the original quiver, but with a smaller vector spaces. Um, the W is always contained in the V split in the two pieces. And the other one uh, is semi-stable with zero stability parameter, so it only has to satisfy the relations. And also this moment map condition at the critical point, which I won't um, go into again, but essentially the stability parameter shifts for each of these. So the stability is stable with respect to a smaller stability parameter. It's semi stable with respect to a zero stability parameter. Okay, so if the relations are homogeneous, so for example, as polynomials I wrote down before for the relations, those are quadratic. Um, even if they're not, as long as they're homogeneous polynomials, then you can always definition retract. Um, these representations here, you can just shrink them to zero without affecting them. Okay, so the homotopy type of this critical set is exactly this space of stable representations for this group here, the smaller um, dimension vector. So essentially, you're reducing the dimension vector at each of these non-minimal critical sets. Okay, so this is before you can try and analyze the long exact sequences to relate what happens when you go past the critical set. So if you've got say value A and value B up here, you can try and understand how this critical set is attached to A if you use something on the topic to B. And for that we use the main theorem of what's there before. So theorems one and two say that, that is at least up to homotopy the same as attaching formal points that flow up to this group set here. Then you can flow down from the level B, you can flow down to the set. So when you try to analyze the change in homology from ZA to ZB, then that's the same uh, for applying excision, the same as analyzing the change in homology from looking at this attachment and then just removing the group. So for example, um, again for homomorphic bundles, so for a tier and box picture, this was um, this shows up as a bundle over a um, modular space of stable models with small array. Okay, so these, at least in the manifold case, these are computable. Right, so we want to try and understand the terms in this exact sequence. So once again, what we like is to show that this map here is zero. This is something that computers um, uh, in a smooth feature, we would like to have all of them in a single feature. Okay, so when everything is smooth um, and we're looking at the moment map, there are standard theorems that explicitly describe this unstable set, some sort of this bundle. And then you can um, try and understand what these, the homology of these spaces are, like, just by gluing this together, because it's a manifold. Once again, on a singular space, nothing works, so we need some new theorem, because all the points that flow up to a critical set, you know, on a manifold, you can kind of understand that using sort of standard local coordinates. But on a singular space, this could be anything. You want to cut out a singular space, how do you know you haven't sort of cut out some strange subroutine? Right? Maybe you can, maybe you can. All right, so we want to try and understand that somehow. Um, the problem is that we can't take derivatives, 
So there's no Morse index when you do that. And we can't choose compatible local coordinates around the critical sets because we're on similar states. So instead, the idea is to construct some space that we can describe explicitly, so it almost a negative slice. And you want a homeomorphism of pairs between these two spaces. So this is the one that appears in the main form of the Morse theory, but we don't know what it is. And this one is something we can describe explicitly. So we have some hope of understanding this topology. And when we do this, we want to show that um, this homeomorphism is defined globally, so there's no gluing together. Um, which on a singular space is problematic. And also, um, we want this to be independent of the singularities in the space there. So, so if we wanted to apply the large class of examples, we don't want to have to um, try and sort of come up with different cases for different types of singularities. So the key here is to use the group action, which always preserves the singular space. So that's the last point. But this function must be compatible with the group um, if it is, then we can describe the isomorphism classes in the one set or so. Sorry, can you remind me what the W's are? Oh, the W's are the um, um, all points that follow up to the critical point. So WC is WC of this critical set C. And then if we remove C, WC0 is WC minus the critical set. So using excision, we can reduce this relative homology to a Relative homology of this pair. Okay, so um, the key is to describe the space in negative slice and then show it's really the same as this other state. So. so, what does it look like? It looks like representations that are essentially, if we go back to our critical point from before, um, we've retracted all of these to zero, so we use the sum term that we want. And now you want to look at homomorphisms from this quiver here into this quiver here, which satisfies the relations. And also there's an orthogonality condition, which is essentially saying um, you're sort of going in a negative direction. So I take the negative by space of the initial, not the points around it. Okay, so this is what the terms in the negative slice look like. And the point is we can compute at least the dimension of this space using some homological algebra if we understand something about the representation. So, um, if you forget about these delta uh, homomorphisms, then you're just left with the representation down here. So, we have this nice projection from the negative slice onto the, onto the critical set. So, the fibers of the vector spaces, um, just because there's no the um, polynomials, um, these deltas can't interact. You only have linear terms in the deltas. Because once you go along this path, you're in this group here. You can't have another delta. Okay, so the negative slice looks like all these representations. So instead of writing down the equations, it's probably easier to think of this picture here. So the next theorem is exactly this homeomorphism of pairs that I described before. So instead of looking at the unstable set from that picture there, it's much easier just to look at the negative slice and then try and understand the problem. So that means we can understand explicitly what the attaching object is in the main field of the theory. So if we all make this picture from before, um, we use theorems 1, 2, and 3, we reduce everything to this exact sequence here um, involving the negative slice. So this is an aside, this will become important at the end of the talk. So because um, we can explicitly describe everything in a negative slice, then we can describe where the points flow down to as well. So if we know an isomorphism class here, and we flow down, then we'll sort of well develop a theory that says that the winner is determined by the algebraic geometry of the initial condition, in particular the hard rate of filtration. So if you know that, you know what the downward slope is. If it's in the negative slice, you know that um, up to the group action, it's in the unstable set, which flows up to this group point. So essentially, you can write down spaces of pairs of critical points connected by a flow line if you just understand what the negative slice looks like. So in other words, we can classify the space of flow lines here and understand these forgetful maps down to the critical sets. And these are exactly the spaces that appear in the 
cut product construction from before. So the next theorem says that um, when we look at this picture, like I had before, you have a space of pairs of critical points connected by flow lines, also projecting that standard of critical sets. From the earlier description of the critical sets, we see we have projection maps down to modular spaces of representations of quitters. This is what this M represents. Um, the different dimension vectors and the relations that I wrote down before. So we have some induced variety of induced set down here. So the next theorem says is exactly what Macrogen is Hecker correspondence for critters. So this is um, the Hecker correspondence that appeared in medicine as well, used to construct representations of our so that appears in this flow line picture here in terms of space of pairs of critical points connected by flow lines. Okay, just as an aside, because this is um, talk about, uh, this is a conference about Higgs bundles, and I feel guilty because I haven't said anything about Higgs bundles yet. You can also prove this for the annual 6 point. So the analysis is more complicated, um, but it turns out that a similar result is true. The main issue is that you can't just flow back up because um, the gradient flow resembles the heat equation, so there's no reverse heat flow. So you have to construct the solutions by hand. So in that case, uh, you have two critical sets like this, and again, you can describe space of the flow lines between them. So this is so. Uh, I'll just do the angle just to keep it simple, where the Higgs field is zero. You can describe spaces of uh, flow lines between those critical sets, and that's exactly, once again, um, the Hecker correspondence, so those are the pairs of points connected by flow lines. As an aside, there's another um, uh, sort of uh, follow-up theorem to this, that if you have a lower critical point down here, um, and you want to describe flow lines that go all the way down here, then inside the unstable set you have a copy of the curve, or for Higgs bundles you have a copy of the spectral curve, and the points on this curve determine where the flow goes down to. So for example, if this is uh, E1 plus E2, you want to flow down to, um, it's easier for line bundles, I'll just say, In general, you just want to do a Hecker modification, which for a line model is just uh, it's like this. So you want to flow down to there, that's exactly given by just taking the point P on this copy of the curve and then flowing down. Um, same if you pick another point, say Q, maybe that flows down here. And then if you flow down to P plus Q, given by all the points on a line going through these two points here. So you have this geometric way of describing the flow lines. And also this suggests, um, this is in progress at the moment, suggests a compactification of the space of the flow lines, given by um, blowing up these secant varieties around the, uh, the points where they degenerate. So the plane is non-degenerate, you want to blow it up at the degenerate points, and that should give you the compactification of the space of the flow lines. Okay, the Hecker correspondence for principal models or principal heat models from this point of view? This um, is something that is not easy to do. Yeah, so I've done this for vector models. Um, you should be able to see this. Well, I was talking about this in the middle, um, but we never worked it out. Because it's from another point of view, it's rather complicated. Yeah, you can describe flow lines for principal models in essentially the same way. So maybe you could maybe define that correspondence as well and see if they would That hasn't been done, but I think it's interesting. So in higher rank, when you do the elementary transformation, you also need a choice of like, not only the dual of the fiber of the bundle of the fiber. So yeah, that's where, right. is that, where is that coming from? Um, so yeah, once again, um, for Yang and Orse, this comes from this curve is replaced by projectivization of the bundle. So instead of this, you want to look at so for line models, this is just the curve itself, but the higher rank you want to pick points in here instead of something. Yeah, so these points correspond to uh, heat modifications, as you said. 
Um, for Higgs bundles, you have a spectral fluid sitting inside. Yeah, or a modification of the spectral fluid sitting inside. And that's what happens. Okay, so that's, um, I will say one more thing about Higgs bundles at the end of the talk. Um, for my own back to quivers. So all the moisture in the box. Excuse me. In the continuous yeah. case, the sum of the middle cohomology was that's not the representation. What would be Higgs bundle case? So if I just repeat something like what he did, what do I get? Instead Actually, of I don't know. Um, I'm not sure if that's known, but that's one of the questions I'll state at the end. Yeah, I think that's an interesting question. Um, I don't know the answer. Um, but the analysis will be more complicated um, if we study that. That's the one thing I'm doing. Okay, so back to representations of quivers. So everything I described um, before, theorems 1 to 4, that fits into this setting. So we have this exact sequence, we can turn this into this exact sequence, which we have some potential of understanding using these first three theorems. So the two remaining questions are how do we compute these groups here, and when, do, when is this map to zero? Okay, so um, as we said before, the negative slice of the vector of the critical set um, has vector spaces as fibers, but the dimension is non constant. This is the issue. It's not a nice vector bundle. This is something that we would want to solve for each bundle. Um, so each critical set in this picture here, maybe I could just expand the you know, critical set, maybe it'll be something like this. It has the sum one side where the dimension of the bundle is um, constant, or at least right bound the bottom. So these are analogous to my cruel earth on one side. So if we can, the philosophy is that we can describe those OSI when the index jumps, then we can understand the cohomology of this um, uh, negative slice with respect to the negative slice minus. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to understand these are the completeness of the relations. We can show that that's related to understanding the co-dimension of the image of the representation. That is exactly like looking at another quiver, uh, which is a modification which is very similar to what we get when we look at the negative slice here. So we take our vector space divided into two pieces. This is the part that's orthogonal to the image. Then the representation has to look like this. Okay, so we've taken our representation. I only want the ones where the co-dimension of the image is bigger than this dimension here. And those representations look like, like this, some modified group. Okay, and again, I'll just emphasize that all Nakajima's examples, um, you can do this, so because the relations are complete and quadratic. All right, so again, we can define these low side. This is the subset of the critical set where the co-dimension of the unit is greater than or equal to this number r. And then we can restrict the negative slice to this set. Okay, and again, we want to compare that to the negative slice minus the critical set. So, in general, um, you would like to do this where um, you don't just have a single vertex quiver like in the previous example, but actually just an arbitrary quiver like, for example, the AOE spaces or uh, the Hansel quivers. In that setting, um, you don't have a um, total ordering on the integers, you have some partial ordering on dimension vectors. And then you want to make that compatible by picking a total order. So, I guess I want to mention that setting is more complicated. Some of the ideas will work in that setting, but for now I'm just going to restrict the ADHN for the remainder of the talk. Um, it's easier because um, this set here is the same, you know, being bigger than some integer is the same as being greater or equal to the next integer. Okay, so in that setting you have these filtrations of the negative slice, and you want to try and understand this long exact sequence from before. You can do that just by iterating. Sorry, again, I'm going too far from the computer. You can do that by iterating um, some mildly torus construction. So you want to relate this set to this set. You do that by um, taking a neighborhood of the sub variety and um, using the mildly torus sequence. So this is the complement of the sub variety. Because it's a variety, it has a nice neighborhood that attracts some of the variety. Okay, and then the remaining space is something like this. Okay, so if this map here in the exact sequence is subjective, um, which it is when R is, um, is 
be a fossil, then it turns out um, that this map here, we can prove that this map here is a sort of vector as well. So this is a sort of vector, and we can inductively assume this is a sort of vector because in the face space it looks like a vector bubble. Then we can do a diagram chase argument to show that this map is a sort of vector. So this is the um, uh, this is true, but we want to make this for the whole critical set. I'll just write it over the R. We can do that by iterating it over. So the question is, how do you show this horizontal map is sort of vector? Well, you can do that um, by once again studying what these, um, these sets look like. So because that looks exactly like the picture from the negative slice, then really you want some criteria for perfection on this smaller representation. Proving that that holds involves proving a criterion for perfection on an even smaller representation. And eventually, once you keep iterating the argument, you get to the end where it's true. So if you use induction to prove that the criterion holds, so for a single vertex quiver, like the AHM quiver, the more strike proportion is perfect. So over C, these long exact sequences are split into short exact sequences. And you get this direct sum. So the total space is a direct sum of the contributions from the relative qualities around the curve sets. So we can also do the diagram chase argument with coefficients in Z as well. And um, so I'm cheating a little bit here. So there's a there's old Nakajima for the AHM quiver um, that says that the um, cohomology is a torsion free. So it'd be much better if we had a Morse theory to prove this. Um, because then this whole argument here would be intrinsically Morse theory. But if you take this shortcut, then you can show that this um, direct sum here actually splits over the integer. So in particular, all the groups on the right hand side are free billion, and homology is dual with homology in this case. So you don't have to worry about universal coefficient here. Mm. Okay, so now we can talk about the ring structure on this um, homology of the total space here. So um, this uh, is the homology of the classifying space of the unitary group, which is just a um, polynomial group. So this naturally has a representation of the finite dimensional isomorphic algebra with these operators here. So this is um, just multiplication by one of the monomials in this polynomial ring. And this is differentiation um, by this um, with respect to the sub variable. So these satisfy these commutation relations here. So if you um, using coefficients in C on this polynomial ring, then you can turn this into a Hilbert space um, with respect to this norm here. Maybe I want to run down the norm. The idea is you want to look at entire functions on CN and then impose some norm on that to make it a Hilbert space. This is due to Wagner in the 60s. He did this. So these are adjoint operators. And the point here is that topologically these correspond to cup and cap products on the infinite grass model, which is the um, classifying space of the inventory. So of course the cap product is on homology and the cup product is on cohomology. So you need this inner product to relate the two. So that's um, where Biden's inner product comes in. <coughs> so to do that, then this direct sum of these quivers or these um, contributions from the critical sets uh, looks like Fox space with respect to this completion. And the operators are defined topologically. So most theoretically we can see this um, using these flow lines. So what we said before, that this space uh, looks like Nakajima's Hecker correspondence after we're attracted and we're divided by the group action, that means that these operators factor through the Hecker correspondence. Okay, so I'm almost at the end, I need a couple more slides to go. So this construction, a special case of this, where you look at Hilbert schemes of points on surfaces, then Nakajima uses this to construct representations of the Heisenberg algebra on the direct sum of the column, <coughs> which are dual to the variable homology. If you take a surface to be just C2, then this is an academic quiver variety, which is exactly the ADHM quiver from before, where the dimension of this W space is equal to Y. So in this picture here, the quiver varieties in this direct sum of academia, these are quiver sets, 
And the push pull maps um, define the cup product of PDF. Um, they factor through the anchor correspondence. And the relations in this representation come from the cup and cap products on the grass plane using the single product. So the point of this is um, we're not really removing any of the difficulties. Um, we're just sort of pushing them around. And the last step, um, the last step in the construction of proving that the relations hold, um, the point is that that last step is very really easy because it's just given by analyzing this point. Mm -hmm. So no difficulty in that step. But there are <coughs> difficulties in the other steps. So doing the analysis around the critical sets and proving this direct sum um, decomposition as well. So I'll just finish with a few questions. So um, the point here is that Nakajimi is a geometry of Kruger varieties to prove new results about algebras that people couldn't prove using algebra. This is sort of the motivation of the geometric representation tool. So a bunch of questions. One is, can you see representations of different algebras just by replacing the ADH algebra with another group? That's a natural thing to do. Um, of course, the last theorem, theorem 5, um, needs to be generalized to do that. And if you do that, maybe you can see the relations between um, using cup and cap products on simple spaces using some inner product to um, define, to relate homology and homology. Okay, so by generalizing theorem 5, we might be able to do this for more general algebras. And then um, what Samson asked before, what happens for Higgs bundle? So I don't know the answer, but I'm sure it would be interesting. So I think that's a good place to finish, so thanks. actually on the last question there, which is, in Nakajima's case, you, you have to sum over all uh, C1 and C2, the first and second chunk of or EDHA. And only when you sum, you are getting the entire right? So in the case of Higgs bubbles, what would be analog of summing over first and second chunk of Actually, there is analog. You are summing over fluxes of the uh, curvature over the human surface. So you have to consider some kind of interflow. And then, so, uh, as far as I understand, some of my work in this language would be <coughs> stating that there is some quantum algebra that appears in case of Higgs bundle, which is uh, 
related to related to some young here. So I mean, what appears there is a case of Higgs bundle in different way of looking, uh, probably mathematically more related to the stable envelope business, is that you're getting uh, uh, quantum algebra that appears in the what's called Lieb linear model or the Berezi model of the uh, Schrodinger operator with delta function interaction. This is the oldest model that was sold in beta ansatz. So that beta ansatz appears, okay. which, which suggests that the it has to be this Youngian algebra which connects to the beta ansatz. Okay, so maybe that might be the Yeah, see, that picture I just described is dual to what you have described. Okay. Yeah, maybe I can ask you. Okay, so no other questions. Uh, we assume at 4:25. We thank uh, uh,